Great. Thanks, Roy. Appreciate the uh, introduction. And <clears throat> for those that know CFGI, you, you've probably heard it said that uh, you know 99% of our employees are former Big Four. I always joke that I'm a one percenter, not not an income, but uh, that I'm non-Big Four. So my background is not as a uh, accountant or a CPA. I actually have a background in software and technology. So I'm a little bit of an oddball for CFGI, but that's kind of why I came over is to help stand up and build out our technology consulting practice. Um, I also, I, I do have a degree in finance and accounting, but I always joke that you know, I did fail accounting one and I barely passed with a C minus. So I changed my major to finance with a minor in accounting and, and never really went down that path. So glad to speak with you guys today and, and share a little about um, this thing called RPA, which I assume some of you have probably heard about. Uh, I just gave a, a similar speech at the AICPA conference, CFO conference last month. And uh, it's definitely something that's on a lot of people's minds. So let me go and pull up my deck real quick for you. And let's, we'll get started. So the key things that I'm going to cover, let's get this going. Is what is RPA? You, you, again, you, you've probably heard some of the hype and, and buzz around it. Um, there's a company called UiPath you might have heard of that just went public a month ago. Two years ago, they're valued at $200 million. They went public at $35 billion with a B. So again, it's hard to escape the notion of RPA these days. Uh, then give you some, something tangible around why are companies investing in RPA? And lastly, for you, where to look for automation opportunities within your organization. Uh, I can't see everybody because I'm only seeing like five people at a time and, and wish I was in the room with everybody because I would love to see a show of hands uh, of who has done RPA or has experience. But does anybody have any stories before we jump in they'd like to share or have experience on automation? Uh, yes, this is uh, Steve Heilman. Um, we had uh, we were one of the early adopters of UiPath. Uh, we had okay. some success uh, um, in the financial area, looking at some um, some process automation there. Um, did a little bit also in HR, but uh, we're also focused in the IT operations area. We felt between gotcha. finance and IT operations that was the um, the treasure trove of potential opportunity. Um, we looked at automation anywhere, uh, but opted for UiPath because it gave a little bit more uh, flexibility with customization and um, uh, yeah, available options for leverage. That's good that we actually have somebody that's deployed it because a lot of times people are like, oh, I kind of know what it is, but not really. Um, so let me, I know it's early this morning, so maybe I try to get your attention with a couple of quotes and stats. So. Uh, these are from McKinsey and Gartner. The first one is saying is from McKinsey saying by 2030, between 75 million and 375 million workers will need to switch their categories of their work. Not saying those jobs are going away because they're definitely not saying that, but they're going to have to change the type of work they do. And it's mostly because of the rise of machines and, and a little less of Skynet and Terminator of actual physical machines. Uh, that is applicable a little bit on the plant floor for some organizations but mostly around automation of processes. So that, that is uh, you know, definitely something that's here now um, and, and happening pretty rapidly. And the next one is from Gartner saying by 2024, organizations will lower their operational costs by 30% by using automation with resign, redesigned operational processes. And that's where companies like CFGI and our business transformation practice come into play. We're looking at all things of people process technology and where do you change a process design? When can you leverage technology like automation to really drive efficiencies and savings? So you will see you know, a lot of, of real world savings by, by using automation. Um, so a couple of, of quotes or headlines of press clippings. Again, I, it's hard to escape some of this. There, there's so much around automation, so much buzz. Uh, the first is from CFO.com saying it's unanimous. Firms that know bots will expand their usage. So this talks about uh, companies that have piloted or done POCs with automation, they're doing more. They're not doing less and getting out of it. They're continuing to do automation. A similar article from the Wall Street Journal, Unleash the Bots, Firms Report Positive Returns with RPA. And a lot of this is around RPA is not an overly expensive technology. This is not um, an ERP implementation that's eight figures and you know runs through a CFO and a CIO in three years. I mean, this, this deploys in a quarter, it's low cost, high speed, which is why it's adopted so quickly. Forbes Magazine, um, how RPA could automate tasks for four types of jobs. Well, no surprise, the number one role they're talking about that it's gonna automate away is finance roles. So it's finance, commercial loan operations, internal audit, uh, customer services. Those are all types of tasks that are usually pretty redundant that are 
kind of going away or being replaced by automation. Uh, and I don't know if anyone saw this one. This was about two months ago from the New York Times saying, the robots are coming for fill in accounting. So and that's a good headline grabber. And you, you dig in and read a little bit more about it. Um, and what it says is you'll see a lot of press clippings. Company X has automated 200 processes using automation. And the article says, well, wink, wink. What that really means is company X has laid off 20 people in that department, which is true in some degrees, but not all the time. So uh, the article also talks about um, State Farm automated 210,000 hours without any layoffs. So it, it varies for every company. Not everybody is doing automation for restructuring or efficiencies. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons why. And I can tell you, post-COVID, I've been in the automation space for five plus years. It is far less about um, efficiencies and savings from workforce reduction as it is employee satisfaction, because I think everybody's so fried of sitting on Zoom calls. And they're trying to unload the tasks that humans don't want to do anymore. So those are just a couple of you know, recent press clippings that are out there. Uh, so let's do the first uh, uh, polling question. So uh, what digital areas do you expect to be a priority for your team in 2021? You have five options. The first is data and analytics tools. Second is RPA and workflow automation, uh, accelerating the digital skills of your team, enterprise-wide digital investment, or cloud-based ERP. So um, go ahead and take 30 seconds and click your answer. Can you okay, see that? great. Oh. We do data analytics at the top of the charts, followed by RPA, digital skills, digital investment, and, and ERP. And, and that mirrors pretty close to what we've been seeing enterprise wide. It's uh, usually uh, data and analytics, you know, kind of with a bullet. This is a, a, a survey of CFOs, um, followed by RPA. So you all fa fall right in line with that. And, and that's um, you know, kind of kind of what we see. That's the other part of our practice is, you know, we, we do data and analytics and deploy workflow automation for our clients. But this is a, an area of hot investment for CFOs around RPA. Again, I, I touched on it's low cost. It deploys quick. Uh, your peers in IT typically like it. So it, it, it definitely is something that a lot of your peers are looking at. And if you actually compare this with CIO surveys, um, chief information officers, you'll see that their top priority for the past couple of years has been automation. So, you know, being in the software and technology space for a couple of decades, it's usually finance that controls the first springs, the first strings of IT. And very rarely have I seen alignment from finance and IT on the same technology at the same time, which is what we're seeing with automation. So I think it's a big reason why it's kind of growing and accelerating so quick. And if you all have any questions, please jump in. I, you know, obviously this is a, a networking. If we're sitting around eating breakfast, it would probably be a lot more interactive. So, uh, you know, would prefer people jump in versus questions at the end, but um, you know, feel free whatever style works best for you. So, we'll jump into what is RPA and kind of just give you at a high level what this is. Again, we're not talking about physical machines. We're talking about software robots and, and all these robots are doing is performing a set of repeatable tasks. So think about the way uh, anything that you do that's following yes, no, if, then, nothing that's really that's using judgment, but just following sequences and steps. Um, it operates in a user interface layer. And what that means is if I go into a website um, and I type in a username and password, a robot or an RPA bot would do it the same way. They're not, they don't have some API interface. They're actually going into that website, pulling up a browser, typing in a username and password and accessing information. So the exact same way we do it again, all it's doing is replicating human action, human interactions over and over and over the same type of thing that we do. And again, very lightweight technology, um, CIO, CTOs like it because of that notion that it, it's not, uh, you just need a couple of virtual machines to stand this up and get running. So a good example of, of what a RPA bot could do, let's just say, you know, on a personal level, if every day I go in and I bank with Wells Fargo and if I go in, I type in wellsfargo.com, I go to my checking account, I click checking account and I want to download my statement every day and save it to my desktop. I click save statement, uh, put it on my desktop. The RPA bot would do the exact same thing. It would go to Explorer. It would type in wellsfargo.com. It would actually know, because he trained the bots on quote unquote where to look, it would know where to go in. It would have its own credentials, its own username and password. It would type in that information. It would know where to click and hover over to open up my checking account. And then I would know how to um, save the desktop. So all the things that that's a you know personal example, 
Um, you know, think about within your organization, you could have a robot monitor your, you know, payables at company.com. That's something that a robot could easily do. So the robot could look for an email to come in. It could open the email. It could look for a string or a series of numbers, which would be a PO. And it would pull that information. It would open the PDF, extract the data. Um, and then let's say you're using NetSuite, open NetSuite and, and log that information. So those are all things of, of the way that bots work. And again, they act just like humans do. They're using the same systems, the same interfaces, um, and it's lightweight. So again, it's just sitting on top of existing infrastructure, which is why it deploys really quick. Um, so second polling question, what RPA outcome would most benefit your organization? And there's four options, cost reduction, the availability of 24-7 workforce because the bots, you know, always joke they work weekends and nights and they're not hungover, so they can work all the time. Greater employee satisfaction or error reduction on tasks. Okay, got the answers are in. Uh, no surprise, the most recent times I've done this, error reduction has been the top one. Um, employee satisfaction, we've got number two. Cost reduction, third. Uh, workforce availability, that kind of in last place. So yeah, th this this follows. Obviously, th there's no wrong answers here. Uh, every organization does it for different reasons. Um, Steve, I'm curious to, if you don't mind me picking on you. When you guys got into automation, would love to hear what the business drivers were for your organization uh, getting started on automation. Um, there are a couple of things. One, uh, it was just getting acclimated with the tool, uh, being a services and IT organization. We wanted to build up that skill. And so we used internally as a way of, of building that, that, that expertise. Uh, we focused initially in, in finances because we, we knew there were processes that could be automated for redundant type activity. Um, basic things that you gave an example, but they, you know, we had many folks in the accounting uh, area that they were just doing basic things like that, logging and checking something, downloading something onto a spreadsheet, and we were able to automate that. Um, it was not focused on cost reduction. Um, and I don't think, I don't recall any folks actually being um, re reduced based on our success at some of that automation. If anything, it allowed for them to focus on higher value type activity. Um, I guess the big thing for us too, though, was really getting some of our processes documented and making sure we weren't automating a bad process. That That is something right. that uh, we found out early on is to um, use this uh, uh, area as a way of just reevaluating the process and doing you know, process change before automating it. Oh, great, Th thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that's, uh, that's spot on for, for what we, we see organizations getting an automation. So if we extend a little further, maybe we'll, we'll just kind of touch on these. Um, you know, five, six years ago when automation got really, you know, took, took speed and you saw a lot of banks, a lot of insurance companies using automation in the back office. So think about if you're a large uh, insurance carrier and you've got uh, back office operations in a low labor country, and you're paying a, a third party, you know, seven figures to do some of this redundant work, company, those companies got in and said, gosh, we're going to build these bots to do this instead. And that make all the sense in the world, right? If you can reduce a contract that you have for a, uh, a subcontractor and replace that with ro robots that you own and you build those on shore, that's great. So we saw a lot of that. Uh, reduced error reduction is a big thing. The uh, robots don't you know, misfinger keys or make mistakes. So that's a, a big component. Um, what has changed a lot, I can tell you in the past two years since COVID has increased employee experience. So uh, I think employee retention, the people that are still at their organizations are very valued. A lot of companies don't want to see them turning over and trying to hire. It still feels like a pretty tight labor market, I think, for most of us. So keeping those people happy, um, and especially in, in areas in finance, AP and AR, those are usually pretty high turnover. Some of those clerks, and especially in um, you know, cities like Philly and New York, it, it's, it's hard to keep those people around. So really taking that, that stuff off their plate that is boring, redundant, that they don't want to do is why we're seeing uh, kind of a, a big rise in automation. Um, and the 24 workforce is uh, a pretty big one as well. We have a insurance client where we built a bot and it wasn't a bot that was saving thousands of hours. Um, he literally, we called it the 4am bot and his number two, this is the CTO, his number two 
was going, thought he was going to quit because he had to run a report every day at 4 a.m. And for some reason, I don't know why, but it, like he, he could only run it and he had to go in the office to do it and send the report to leadership. And we built a bot in 10 days just to run this report. Again, not saving thousands of hours, but there's a thing that, that really helped from uh, you know employee experience uh, ran the bot on schedule on time and that CTO was able to keep that person and retain them. So there's a lot of different things that you see around automation, but all these are good reasons why to get into them. I usually see, we see a quite a blend of it. Um, things around the close process is something we continue to see more and more of close acceleration. So, you know, if you're saving four hours during your monthly co close, <clears throat> excuse me, or your quarterly close, those hours usually have a multiple of importance versus some other things. So we see a lot of that. And we'll touch on that a little bit more about, um, you know, what makes sense and, and frankly, why are companies investing in RPA? And the big reasons are, <clears throat> I think every one of you, your companies, you could probably think of three to four, if not quite a bit more candidates for automation that have some semblance of this. They're high volume. It's rules-based, meaning if this happens, then do this then go do there, right? Not having to think and structured data. So um, Excel, PDF, uh, not unstructured data, like you know, hand, handwritten invoices on a napkin. So you likely have candidates that are like this and every organization does. I think that's one of the neat things about automation. It did start out at its infancy as I'm a multi-billion dollar insurance company or multi-billion dollar banking conglomerate. Um, it makes sense for automation. Now we see much smaller organizations in every vertical doing automation. Um, you know, there are some companies that are using citizen developers to do it. Uh, some companies are, are using firms like ours to run their automation program. So there's a wide range. Uh, and I'll touch on you know, this is a, a great cheat sheet. I can, you know, happy to distribute. I know you guys will have this on recording, but uh, what type of processes should you look for? So when you're thinking about in your, in your organization, any type of data entry is a really good candidate. So that's really something that humans don't really need to do anymore to enter information from one system to another. And data entry could be things like uh, setting up a new customer, setting up a new account, setting up a new vendor. Usually that's sitting in some, some system or maybe in Excel and somebody's reading that and then typing it into NetSuite or SAP or Oracle or whatever it is. So those are things that bots do really well. Data migration between non-integrated systems. This is a really big one as well. So think about if you're, uh, you have a legacy green screen application that was home built that you guys built 20 years ago, and that's trying to pull data into NetSuite. Well, I guarantee if you go ask your CIO to build that API, he or she is going to say, yeah, not really strategic. My developers don't want to build an API. I can get to that in 18 months, and you as a CFO or controller get frustrated. They say, well, how can I get a workaround? Well, this is a great way to use a robot. They can go and pull that data just like humans would do. Go pull the, the information from the green screen, push it in a NetSuite, and you're done. You didn't have to build a complicated API, and it's a great workaround to problems like that. Um, let's see. Scraping web data. This is another really good utilization of bots, and maybe one people don't think about as much. Um, as an example, we built robots for one of the largest music streaming companies out there. And in order to prove that the ad was playing on the streaming app, they had a team of three people. Their entire job was to show, here's the Coca-Cola ad playing on the app, take a screenshot, drop it in a folder. And that's all they did full time was here's the Home Depot ad, here's the Coke, here's the truest app. Just you know, prove it was playing. So that's what we developed a, a series of bots to go do is just do screen scraping. So a bot can go take a picture, drop it in the Coca-Cola folder and, and there it is. So those people are now doing different types of stuff. So um, also getting into any type of web applications is a good example. So I talked about downloading my personal bank statement. A lot of insurance carriers and financial organizations need to go to third party websites and download policies and documents really easy for bots to do to go do that. So those are good, good utilizations of bots. Um, another thing we talked briefly about opening emails and attachments. So you can have bots monitor email boxes, read them. Again, they can't read word for word like we can, but they can look for, we know that a PO number is eight digits and has, looks like this. It will pull that information out. It'll look for it. It will know then, okay, if this number is here, then go to open the attachment, which is PDF. And then it can start reading that, those type of things. Um, and then lastly, copy and pasting. If there are any applications, and I'm no, I know nobody in finance has anything that ever does copy and paste, but those are typically good good candidates for automation. 
a lot of people call that uh, the swivel chair syndrome where you're kind of typing on one computer, and then you move over, type in another like back and forth. That's a really good um, good way to think about what you can automate and what you can't. Ryan, we had a question uh, from Jerry Hampton. Sure. Can you provide examples of customer service applications? Yeah, customer service applications. Um, if, if you, I would say if you have a call center, there's usually a very big opportunity for automation with an, a call center. And what that means is, uh, so again, say you're a bank and uh, you're using your check card at a sporting event. And this happened to me you know, multiple times before. I used to live in Atlanta. I'd go to like a Falcons game and run my banking card three times in 30 minutes getting drinks and food. And then it looks like fraud and it gets blocked. And then I have to call the bank and it usually take like nine minutes to resolve that bot uh, customer service organizations are now using robots to do all that calculation of if, is this fraud or not so you call in and true story wells fargo has actually reduced their um call resolution for fraud from nine minutes to 90 seconds by using a bot so the, the csr on the phone will hit run bot bot goes and runs it presents the information to the csr agent and then they can tell resolve it much quicker so that that's one application uh, another would around customer services or, or um, would be just, you know, in, inputting customer data is a pretty good example of what they could do. Is there another question, Zoe, or is it just that one? Uh, yeah, we have another one from Anthony Carlozo. Can you give some best practices for folks to build the business case to implement this? What data should they provide and how should you tell the story to invest in it? Yeah, absolutely. And just remind me, I'll, we'll cover that towards the end. That'll kind of be, kind of be the wrap up um, that will kind of give a, a, a playbook of, of how to think about that. So part of that playbook, you know, I'll say there's two, two things that are, uh, I think, very imperative. I think it was touched on earlier around success around automation. First is picking the right process up front. If you pick the wrong process, um, you may not be set up for success. Someone might be blaming the software. The software doesn't work. This RPA thing is, is a joke. It's not real. It's my service provider or it's the CIO's fault or it's somebody's fault. So pick the right process up front is really important to success. So this is how at CFGI we think about automation for us and where to get started. We really do look for things in the green and blue is where we're going to get started. So it's again, a mix of high impact and low complexity. So high impact, low complexity, Things like that would look like a reconciliation. Really easy, um, not overly complex, high impact. Usually it takes a lot of people to do that. Um, easy to do, great fit for pilots, meaning we're just getting started. Things that are high impact but higher complexity would be things like using machine learning, which is very common now with automation. So let's just say that it's doing, we've built a lot of bots that are um, handling lockbox exceptions. So different formats for remittances come in, how are you going to handle that? That's using machine learning to look at all these different formats of a remittance and then extract the data out. Again, a, a lot of impact, big teams, big dollars associated with that, big business return, right? If you're clearing out uh, money quicker, but it's a little more complex. So the, the thing that you'll find people usually pivot when they're getting started is, is to the blue category because there's a lot more hours associated and they want to have a big bang and that's fine. But we do usually recommend doing something a little more basic initially just to get something running, to stand it up quick. And then people get really excited and feel the momentum. And then from there you start, you know, building your inventory of other automation candidates. And, and that's another kind of best practice for you is to really come up with your own criteria for what you rate as success for automation, because it's gonna be different for every company and every organization. Some companies, it could be strictly about hours if you're a manufacturing company. Hey, we just wanna cut hours, hours, hours. Others could be something different. So at CFGI, what we do for our, our clients is we come in, we start the data, the extraction process of candidates, and we have these seven criteria that we're thinking about. Is it manual? Is it repetitive work? Is it rules-based? Is it an electronic readable type? standard input, low exception rates, so not a lot of errors or humans need to come in and intervene, high volume and system changes. And what we mean by system changes is lack of system changes. So if you're replatforming your ERP in two months and you're building a bot um, around your ERP, you probably would wanna wait till that process 
is, or excuse me, that ERP is implemented. So we take that and then we use that to kick out, like here's the non-viable options and then here's the one that makes sense for automation and you start building there. So come up with a framework, um, some criteria that you rate as important before you move in picking kind of what that inventory of automation candidates look like. And now we'll move into where to look for opportunities and hopefully, you know, kind of give you some ideas within uh, your organization. Again, spot on that you know, most automation does start within finance accounting. If you talk to other firms out there or the software providers in the space, you know, rough numbers I've heard is between 60 to 70% of all initial automation start in finance and accounting. And if you think about the nature of finance and accounting work, that makes complete sense because it is very rules-based, very redundant, a lot of volume. Um, so most of there, and we'll, we'll cover some of those in more detail, but this does line up in all lines of business. So, Things like time and attendance management, you could have a bot. So what I mean by that is if you're a services organization and everybody has to fill out a timesheet, I'm usually, I get the chasing emails on Mondays when I do my timesheet. You could have that done by a bot. Go into Salesforce, look for people and have a timesheet, flag their name and send a generic email, please get in your timesheet. Really easy to do. Um, again, it's taking, taking load off the back office. Onboarding and offboarding of employees, really easy to do and, and this ties into one onboarding them from a forms perspective if you don't have an advanced uh, platform that can do that for you um so there's that component of actually filling out the forms reading the forms putting them in the system but also onboarding and offboarding from system access so every employee usually has a different level of access to salesforce to netsuite how do you manage how do you have change control around that that's something that is very complicated and something that bots can do very easily so you know that's an area around hr Supply chain, um, a lot around invoice and contract management, freight management and returns processing are big opportunities. We're building a bot right now for one of the largest CPGs in the world, um, all around the freight management process. So they produce a lot of paper products. They need to take information from a green screen shipping system from their shipping vessels and push that into SAP. So we're building a robot and interfaces to pull all that data from their shipping vessel information and push it into SAP. So that's part of a freight management um, workload. IT, we touch on this a little bit. So, you know, application consolidation integration, having non-integrated systems talk to each other, great opportunity to use a robot for a larger organization. Things like password reset and unlock become valuable. Small organizations, maybe not as much, but again, that's that's a simple request that a robot could easily do and manage for an organization. Customer services, things like handling inquiries, order management, uh, a customer account setup. This is one that we see a lot of is setting up new accounts. Usually there's, let's call it, a, you know, a form comes in or an Excel document, here's all the new accounts, and then somebody in customer services goes and sets up those accounts. Those are all things that you could use a bot on a schedule to do. And that's the cool thing about automation and bots. They run at all times of the day. You don't have to wait until 8 a.m. You can just, you know, you're getting information, you know, quicker and in real time. And then as we move into finance, um, a lot of areas here, obviously, you know, are especially around general accounting, journal entries is one that we see a, a lot of um, accounts payable, performing invoice matching, both two and three way, uh, handling approval and expenses, wire transfers is something that is a pretty standard process that we see a lot of companies struggling with like, yeah, why can't we have a bot you know, handle the wire transfers? That's one. Um, I would say that at the at a high, highest level, AP and AR are probably the biggest areas of friction. And I see some head nodding um, around automation. That is usually where there's teams of people. It's error prone. Usually there's uh, people saying there's too many errors, it's too slow, or you can't find people or they're quitting, et cetera, et cetera. A lot is usually in, in AP and AR. So that's usually what we're doing is we're coming in and we're just kind of starting with a baseline assessment to look at what are your processes? You know, are you looking for an HB transformation? Can you use automation? Automa it's not always an RPA bot. It's sometimes you might have an inherent functionality in the systems you already own. I would always say you do that first before you go build a bot. But if you don't have that type of capability in your system, then start using bots to automate some of that. Um, fp and a is, is a big area. So p pulling reports, generating reports is a big opportunity for automation. Um, it actually lets people spend the time interpreting the data versus pulling it. I think 
around the FPNA process, so much time is spent just finding and accessing the information versus actually reading it. And then things like payroll, uh, again, talk about timesheet errors, um, some reporting, there, there's quite, you know, quite a bit around there, again, if you don't have systems. So let me pause there and see, does you know, anything jump off the page for any of you as far as ideas that you have? Like, yeah, why, why couldn't we automate this? Or, or are there any others that are doing automation that you had where you saw success? Brian, these are excellent examples. Okay, good. I, Steve, this sounds like where you, you all got started on your journey, right? It was a, a lot around kind of these areas. Exactly, yep. Yeah. And just as I said, we expand a little bit more into IT operations. That seems to be similar where there's a lot of repetitive process um, that can be uh, updated as well. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Thank you. So I'll share hey, a couple Brian, of quick case studies. Yes. Brian, sorry, anything? before we proceed, could, could you give your perspective on um, how RPA differs in terms of implementation from a small mid-size and large corporation. Specifically, I'm looking for some guidance around small co companies that really, you don't have a lot of resources. You have resources that are focused on multiple processes. And I'm, I'm right. thinking about more of an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial approach where I buy one box and, and give it to the right finance leader and the right IT leader, kind of go off and create a possibility with a quick win and the quick wind builds from one to two to three, the demonstration right. that's low cost and high impact. Yeah, good good question. Um, and there's a couple approaches. Again, you could go with an outsource model. And, hey, we don't, the biggest thing we run into is companies are so busy and lots of projects going on. Like, hey, we don't have time to take our eye off the ball and go start an automation program in addition to all the things we're doing. Uh, so some companies just completely outsource that to us. Like, hey, go do the extraction of processes, build it, manage the entire program. That's one way to do it. The other way, maybe for an organization that's trying to keep this as lightweight as possible, is the notion of citizen development, which you know UiPath does a good job of lower code type automations, where you, you buy a license and you people are training themselves. And most all of these automation vendors have good free training and, and you you build and start with some small automations. Maybe these are desktop automations where it's saving a, a individual a couple hours a week doing, I don't know, extraction from LinkedIn for leads. I'm just making stuff up. And people see that and then people kind of gain some momentum around it. So, you know, there, there's a couple of ways. So citizen development is one. It, it, I would assess your internal, maybe IT organization. There's probably people that have had some interest around automation. Maybe they went through some training and have an appetite. Um, so you can go that route. So kind of two, two ways, you know, again, use a partner or, or kind of go citizen development route to stand that up. Brian, I there, there, and there's, I'm yes, sorry. go ahead. No, no, finish. If you were still answering. Oh, no, I was, <laughs> no, I was done. Go ahead, Morris. Sure. I, I was wondering, um, it seems like what you said, reconciliation. So um, does that mean in the case of uh, payroll, in essence, reconciling payroll, did the people get paid the right amount? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's uh -huh. an, an easy, yeah, you could just have it, um, you know, if it's coming out of your, your payroll provider system and then checking with what was actually, I don't know, dispersed from the bank as you do compare and contrast and then flag up any, any errors or emissions in that. So yeah, that's easy. A lot of, we see a lot of bank reconciliation is one obviously is kind of the obvious one. Uh, we've done some work with private equity firms where, you know, go into um, our bank of America, do an internal compare of invest trend, which is a back office PE system that helps run portfolio companies and look at our, our fund balances and do a compare, send a report. So, you know, reconciliation is a great starting point, Morris. I mean, it's usually very easy to do, um, not overly complex. So if you have any it's reconciliation base, that's a great starting point. And you can set up rules that say, you know, hey, these people flag it if they're getting too much overtime or flag it if they're getting, uh, you know, seems like something was fat fingered or, you know, that kind Absolutely. of piece as well. Yeah. So it's yeah, an audit. Yeah, so you, you could... Yeah, you could set up a rule that, you know, this person gets paid $5,000 every two weeks. And then all of a sudden there's an anomaly of like, they got paid $50,000 or it got doubled for a sequence of two weeks, like send a report for that. So, 
you could do that. You, uh, so that's a great example. And then you could do, um, you could even extend that to, you know, travel expenses too. So nobody's traveling. Why did this person have go into the expense report and look for Marriott and Delta every month, send me a report of who expensed that. Cause we're on a travel freeze for six months. Like, well, why did you expense this? Or go look for uh go, go internet. You know, nobody should be expensing go, go internet anymore at $49 a month because no one's traveling. So go look for those things. So any type of those rules that you can think of, if, it's a, if you can make it a rule, the bot can follow the rule. So a couple of just quick case studies and uh, you know, to be sensitive of time, here's just plenty of uh, you know time for networking questions. Um, B2B invoice processing, this is a bot that we built for um, an IT services organization. Big hours, 19,000 hours saved annually processing invoices. So again, I think there's, there's big opportunities as it relates to, to invoice processing. Next one is invoice creation automation. This was uh, kind of an HSA provider. Uh, 1,500 hours, not all the hours in the world, but actually these were 1,500 CFGI hours that we displaced, which I always, you know, I like t telling the story because um, you shouldn't have consultants like us or your employees for that matter doing some of these tasks that really frankly could be done by robots and we displaced our own consultant hours at you know you know several hundred dollars an hour by these robots so it's a pretty uh pretty good savings for the client but they're thrilled and 100 percent accuracy and in, in the invoices so again think of things like that maybe where you have subcontractors doing work or people that you can't retain those are good opportunities to think about automation uh, and what you can build this is sales and lead management this is for a healthcare company uh, they have data that comes in from Salesforce, a referral list that gets transmitted to the client. What we're doing is extracting the data, doing validations and lookups. Then we pull that information, push it into Salesforce, notify a human that the data has been loaded. So 100% accuracy in processing the leads, round the clock processing, which you know, we haven't measured time to close yet because that's hard for us to track. But those leads are getting into their reps' hands faster. So therefore, in theory, those they're probably you know speeding up uh, you know time to close on those leads. So you know that's another thing. Again, not finance related, but want to kind of highlight highlight that one. So last uh, polling question: What workloads in your organization seem to be good automation candidates? Reporting, data entry or extraction, accounts payable, or invoicing? And this is obviously, this is the most obvious question, but you know, maybe this will stick in your head. Like I should go look into this, this process when I get off this call and maybe see if there's something we can do here. Okay, yeah, data entry and extraction, AP, invoicing and reporting. So that, that follows reporting is, you know, we see less of that. It's a little more complicated because it's, it's pulling out of multiple systems and it's a presentation of data, but the data entry, the AP invoicing, uh, all kind of with um, you know the top of the list for what we see for most organizations. So you know, go go look in your organizations around those areas. Uh, feel free to call me or if you know other people in the space, uh, help you kind of vet through what makes sense. As we're moving into closing, I'm going to talk about the Center of Excellence to talk about how to get started. So again, a couple key things for getting started on automation: one, pick the right process, which we covered. The last thing is thinking about having having a Center of Excellence because this will grow, this will scale pretty quick. As soon as you get this stood up, your peers and IT and client services and HR are going to raise their hands like, I got an idea. I'm going to build a bot. So you need to have a plan for it. So you need to know what this, what technical experts are available, how you're going to support the automation. Think about the infrastructure delivery. Do you want to do an on-prem? Do you want to do cloud? Most of the software vendors now have gone to a cloud model, which is great because you don't need much from an infrastructure perspective. Uh, you need to ensure what the governance looks like. Is this IT... Uh, IT manage, business manage, what does that relationship look like? Provide the strategy across the enterprise. Uh, and most importantly, how do you can continue to cultivate and curate new automation opportunities? I think is really important. Uh, and then assist in change management. So from a visual perspective, this is kind of what it looks like. Um, again, usually what we're seeing are business-driven IT-supported center of excellences hitting on all these seven areas of, again, the vision strategy, the organization, How's it governed? How do you manage a pipeline? What are your development methodologies for delivering the software um, and, and coding of them? Another thing a lot of people don't think about is support. So the, the bots are just like humans. They do need management. They do need some care and feeding. They do run on their own and they're autonomous, but you know, UI changes on websites and things need to be reconfigured in bots from time to time. So you're going to need someone to support and manage those. Uh, it's not a huge lift, but 
there is still some, some care and feeding. So how are you going to support those? Um, what people are going to be involved? And lastly, what does the technology look like? Because, you know, there's automation pieces. There's, there's things like an Alteryx that handles kind of the workflow automation, you know, different components of that. So what does your, your stack of technology look like? Uh, to support your center of excellence. So again, this is not a one size fits all. Every organization is going to be a little different, but definitely something to think about as you get into it, um, into automation. So again, I would say best practice, leverage IT early in the process. One of our biggest issues when we build bots is we work with mostly people like you. We work with finance leaders for the most part. I have a couple of clients that are IT leaders and CIOs and CTOs, but most of them are the business. Get them involved early because what happens is, and I know no one on this call has ever been frustrated with IT that like, forget IT, we're going to go around them and build it ourselves. Well, guess what? You can't do that, but eventually you're going to have to call the CIO and say, hey, this robot needs to have access to NetSuite. And like, whoa, 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 a robot what is accessing our data? Why? And then all the questions come up and the project goes on pause. And then you as the finance leader have to sell to your IT leader and get them comfortable and your project will take about a four to eight week pause. So you get that person on board with automation. So bring them in the process early. It's, it's a, a much easier process. So again, low IT commitment, um, limited infrastructure. Uh, there's great things around compliance. Uh, all activity is logged and traced by the bot. So auditors love it. If you're a public trick company, if you get your, you know, your SOX auditors talking about what are these bots doing? They can see it all. So it's actually a positive thing. It's, it's not a negative. Uh, we have a full SOX practice though. So we actually incorporate you know, compliance into the way we build bots. So again, in, involve IT early. Um, and my last slide is, is best practices around automation. So I'll start with pitfalls first and then we'll end on the positive of the best practices. So again, RPA is not a silver bullet for every problem. We, we've had a lot of deals that we've walked away from clients like, yeah, bot's not the right solution. Uh, this is just, um, you, you need to build some more uh, kind of workflow within Excel or, hey, your black line that you have already does some of this. Don't build a bot for it, have it do it. Or your, uh, we had an insurance company that their agency management system had some functionality, like you don't need a bot for that. So it won't solve everything. Uh, it can solve a lot of things. A cool thing with RPA is this platform agnostics, you know, it streams across a lot of different areas. Uh, make sure you plan for maintenance and support. As I said, these bots do need leaders to manage them. So you need need people, not teams, not armies. Um, I mean, it, your commitment usually is pretty low. That's our biggest question we get is, what's the drain going to be on our team to respond to CFGI or to approve things? It's We're talking hours a week, not like two or three people full time. It's, it's not that heavy. Um, make sure you think about cybersecurity risk and controls. That's another really important thing I just touched on around as it relates to, to SOX. Uh, I think someone touched on this earlier, not understanding the actual process executed. Don't automate a bad process. That's another another you know, great thing around automation. Look at the process first, make sure it's gonna stay that way. It's not a bad process. It's not, I call it the superhero syndrome. Like we don't know how it gets done, but Sally just does a really great job of making it work. But those are kind of hard to automate if you actually don't know what the process is or it's a bad process. So make sure you have that nailed down. And also have a plan for communication um, if, if you don't have one, that the bots are coming, they're taking my job because people see those headlines we shared and they get scared. So think about who you want to include if you roll out a program initially, how are you going to communicate that? If you don't, it can definitely cause problems because people get fearful for their jobs. So best practices, you know, focus on transformation versus automation. What I mean by that is Focus less on we want to get into automation because we think there's a big opportunity for broader transformation within our organization, within our finance group. You know, we can automate out thousands of hours or we can reduce our close process by a day, those type of things versus like, hey, let's just do a POC and try one bot. Well, what I've seen far too many times is we're going to try one bot, then we're going to measure it for six months, then nine months later, you have shelfware. So think, accelerate push the foot on the gas, find the automation, go and go fast. Because if not, you guys have all bought billions of dollars of enterprise software, you can have the tendency to just fall flat. So, you know, think broader. Uh, develop that model, that process selection for what makes sense for you. If you're a smaller organization, if you're a bank, uh, come up with a framework. Again, that's where companies like us can help you figure that out of, of what those process opportunities are. 
Um, I understand the complexity of, of each automation. I, I promise you that you, you each have ideas of automation, but if you sat in the room with someone that reports to you, you're not going to get the same view of that process with is just us for them because they're going to hide the complexity of the work, or maybe they're fearful that my bosses think that I'm too slow, those type of things. So really understand what the process is when, when executives and leaders are, are out of the room is when we actually can figure out how the process works because we usually get on zoom calls and people are kind of fearful to actually tell them how they, they do something. So uh, just have, you know, be mindful of that have document intelligence capability. So this is around the machine learning and the bots being able to read and interpret. Now, I did talk a lot about the bots just follow a series of statements. The, the caveat to that is they are advancing to machine learning of reading documents. So um, doing more invoice processing and, and not having to build an individual template for each format. They're being able to think on their own a little bit as it relates to reading documents. And then the solution design, bot design is a key component. So when we build a bot, we're typically building them in eight to 10 weeks, start to finish. Um, six to eight weeks, six of those weeks roughly is solution design. So we're building uh, a solution design doc. We build a, a current state and a 2B state, and then our clients sign off on that. That's the majority of the time. The actual software development is a couple of weeks, and we have a little bit of upfront of technical architecture to get the environment set up. But there's a lot that you need to make sure that you're documenting properly the current state. And then the 2B is here's what the bot does, here's what a human does, um, get sign off, and then you go and build. So uh, let's see where we're at time. So yeah, let me, that's the uh, the last slide there. So I know we covered a lot at the end, but um, what, what questions do you do you have that I can answer in the, the remaining minutes that we have? Well, uh, Brian, uh, I've listened to many, uh... RPA presentations, and this by far is one of the best. So thank you for, for doing this. Right, Excellent. Really, really well done. Um, I guess one question and one, just one general comment. Um, I think you highlighted it, but just for um, um, verification, I found it to be a totally different uh, set of skills needed to set up the initial environment, to set up the center of excellence uh, versus then maintaining, uh, maintaining the bots depending on the volume. So. Uh, um, that was something to consider as part of uh, you know, your creation of this whole PR, RPA environment. I, my question is to you, do you prefer one tool set over other? Have you used uh, automation anywhere? Have you used UiPath? Are you agnostic to a tool or do you have a preference of a tool of choice? Yeah, we're, we're agnostic. I mean, we're, we're papered partners with Blue Prism Automation Anywhere and UiPath, which yep. if you look at a Gartner Quadrant or Forrester, so those three. are the big three. Yeah, yeah. now the the... If you follow who's growing the fastest, it's UiPath, and I will tell you that the majority of our work we do is UiPath because most companies are using UiPath; they're buying that. I would say that th well, the one thing to be to you know, be on the lookout for, and we are as well, is Microsoft has made a lot of bets in the space. They've made some mm -hmm. acquisitions, so their Power Automate platform is coming on pretty quick. We're not mm -hmm. doing a lot of Power Automate yet, but I think it's going to become a bigger and bigger play in the space. So. Yeah, I, I think Microsoft is quickly moving up. So they cobbled together um, a bunch of old kind of systems and platforms and made one one acquisition for a company in Europe. And they've got a pretty a pretty robust. Now think about automating within the Microsoft stack. So automating within Excel, within Word, within Outlook. Yep. That's kind of what it's doing. So it's it, it's not going to do go to green screen application, go to SAP, open email, build report. But it's power. It's automating within the Microsoft stack, but that will change where it's going to get better and it's going to go across. So mm, great, you know, great insight. Yeah. So mo monitor that one for for sure. Uh, and I'll put this up too as my all my contact information. Hey Brian, yeah, I, I, I know say, there was. A, uh, sorry, there was ahead, there was an earlier question on on business case development. Yep, that's where I was going. So how, how, do you, how do you build the business case? I, I think the, the biggest thing is uh, really start with it, getting an inventory of opportunities and processes. So if you can come up with a list of, hey, we, ha we have an idea of five to seven or 10 processes that make sense for automation, come up with what your metric for success is. It could be hours. I mean, if, like I said, I have some manufacturing companies where it's, you know, our SG&A expenses overweight, we need to reduce heads. Like, hey, we, we can cut 2,000 hours or we can cut the subcontractor and the business gets excited about the allure of the cost savings, um, but it, it could be a different metric. So find what that metric is, 
Um, you know, again, talk about this deploys fast. Make sure you deploy it fast, though, because right? what, what you'll what you'll the problem you'll run into is if you tell the business this deploys in eight to twelve weeks, and then nine months later, you're like, wow, we still don't have the bot running. Well, why is that? It's it's not as easy as everybody said. So make sure you have a plan. And what will derail that and get you off off balance is again not involving IT. The CIO puts the block on the project, and you're fighting internally. Um, so get processes lined up, get IT lined up, get what your value metric is for success for automation, and then scale and build. So again, I, I would I would reference a lot of the you know I call those the FUD statements that I started off today about what other organizations are doing and and how they're growing, um, and, and use that kind of as a you know a driving point to to help kind of sell your automation case. Brian, when I hear you say you reduce costs by 30%, does that really come from people or what other means of cost reduction is possible? Yeah, I mean, it, it, can, it, it does come from people. Um, it does come from technical debt from systems. So if you have, you know, a lot of companies have multiple ERPs or multiple applications that aren't working. So, you know, looking to refine processes uh, move and optimize people to the work that they should be doing, uh, and then retiring of some technical debt around that. So it's it's really a kind of combination of all. But when we're coming in, like we just did a for a, a, a company that's owned by a, a PE firm, it's an insurance company. They had 60 offices, and what we did is we came and built a kind of their shared services organization for finance. So we set up here's your regional hubs that are going to do all your operational processes, and we built a heat map of Here's what the people should do. You're overweight by eight employees in AP. Uh, we know you need other people in other department. You can move them over here. We're going to use bots to automate some of the invoice processing that will offload those eight people to do other things. So we kind of have that balance of looking at the, the whole thing. And, and then with this client, they had two agency management systems in their back office. Uh, they needed to have one single platform. So all those combined is where you're going to start to see the, you know, you know, moving towards that 30% type of efficiency savings. So Brian is, you know, 30%, is that more of like a theoretical meaning like it's FTEs, it's parts of people's tasks or is it real reductions in people? It's it's a blend of both. I mean, the the 30% was a Gartner prediction. Uh, we have seen within our clients, you know, getting close to that in some of the bigger transformation works that we've done. Um, yeah, a it, it, little bit of a blend of both. Thank you. I, I bring that up because yeah. that's that's a pitfall in business case development. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on how how you want to skin that when you when you go to the business for business case justification if you're saying we're, that's a that's a when you say we're going to reduce back office costs by 30 percent could there be eye rolls at the board level like oh, really I, mean, I feel like i've heard this a, a billion times in my life so you know maybe more things on tangible because i work with a lot of cfos and like hey we're, we're saving eight hours in the close process and I'm like that's gold for us that that's what's going to and executives care. Like if you're accelerating the close and it's more accurate, that becomes less of the hours and the efficiencies and the dollars and more around, uh, you know, speed to close. And that's something that, you know, board and executives care about. So, you know, there's a little bit of a uh, nuance to it, depending on each organization on, on how you present uh, what your business case justification would be. But that's where we, when we go through and we're doing this for our clients, we, we, we look at, let's say 10 processes and each process, we actually have an ROI calculation. That's where we work with, and it's not, not every ROI is hours saved. It's time to close leads faster or, you know, some are hours, some are savings, but that's where it's going to vary from organization to organization and even inner department within your own company. So I just have one more question about that. Just so what, it, what are most companies you know, it's really along the lines, I guess, of, you know, where they see the most potential value, but what are most companies putting forth as a business case as, as 
I mean, are they doing things like, you know, we've lost a lot of people because they're doing too much transaction based work and we can, are there other metrics besides cost? Yeah, there's other, other metrics around cost. I think a big one is just competing better. I think a lot of board level people are concerned about if our peers are automating behind the scenes, they're getting more efficient, they're responding to customers faster, they're retaining their people better. How are we going to compete? I mean, the new world is not going to be the way it is. I mean, it's humans working next to uh, machines and, and robots. And those are the companies that are going to compete better. And I'm, I would bet, I remember there's a stat out there, but I haven't seen one yet for this space, but I, I would like to put a, an AI model to, to do some data extraction, but I'm sure in time, if you start tracking companies that are heavily invested in automation, their performance, like their stock and S&P performance are going to outperform other companies that aren't. So I, I think those things are big drivers of why companies and executives care because they know their competitors are heavily investing. If you're a bank and you're an insurance company and you're not using automation, you're getting smoked by your competitors. They're processing loans faster. Uh, they're having more accuracy. They're, they're moving things through quicker. They're generating more revenue uh, because you're stuck with, you know, a bunch of team of people and, um, you know, a low labor country or, you know, a services center doing it that just can't do it at the speed of, of robots. So I, I think competitive and top line growth is a big thing to think about. That, and that was frankly, was the big trend. That was the big trend pre COVID was it became less around cost savings and more about like, we can't find any more people. They don't exist. We can't hire them. Like our only way to compete and continue to grow is to build these digital workers next to the humans. Like we have to do that. And that's where people really got into it. And then it changed a little bit with COVID, you know, a little more balance of cost savings and employee satisfaction. Beacon is the premier executive networking organization serving the mid-Atlantic region. To learn more, go to beaconforlife.org.